Today it's my father's house. We're going to teach lesson number 24. We're going to be speaking about the ministry of reconciliation. Say ministry of reconciliation. All right, praise the Lord. A beautiful topic, and it goes hand in hand, of course, with what we have touched on uh, in our lessons a couple of Sundays back to do with spiritual reproduction. In fact, we will be referring uh, to that again today. Very important topic, uh, and it is at the core of everything that we are as Bible-believing Christians, as people who reflect uh, the, the glory and the Spirit of God the scriptures at uh, the very center have a major theme from Genesis through to Revelation, and it is to do with just that, reconciliation. Reconciliation. Does anybody know what reconciliation means? What does it mean to reconcile? Brother Mike. To bring back. Yes. To bring back. That's good. Yes, uh, Bill. Into the same, on the same page, in the same balance. Yeah, okay, very good. To get everyone on the same, on the same balance. Very good. Any other ideas of the meaning? Yes, please. Very good. Yeah, different individuals from Mary Walker's life just coming in together into one mind, one accord. Very good. That, that does describe the, the, mean, the meaning of that word. And uh, we want to have a look at what the scripture says first up. It says this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18, it says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So I want you to notice what has happened here. By his grace, God reconciled us to himself. How? Through Jesus. Through Jesus, he brought us on the same page. He, he made, we were enemies, and he made us friends. Uh, we were estranged, and he met us family. We had no name, he gave us his name. We had no life, but he gave us his life. He brought us on the same page. He synchronized, he made us anew. He reconciled us to himself. But then he did something very special. We who were reconciled now become the ministers of that reconciliation. We become the ones who seek others to bring them on par, on even, Yes, aligned with God himself. So we have a ministry, and if you wondered whether you are in the ministry or not, then perhaps you may not be called to be a pastor or a minister in the sense of in a church setting of a, an evangelism or a, apostle or teacher or what have you, but you all, we all have a ministry. It is the ministry of bringing people who are estranged from God who are sinners, who are distant, who do not know God, to bring them into communion with God, into relationship with Him. That's what we want to speak about today, the ministry of reconciliation, a very important topic. So let's define it together. Uh, it means to restore something that was lost, to restore to its original uh, state, to bring into agreement with, clearly when we are sinners, we're disagreeing with God. We're not in agreement with God. Uh, and God brings us into reconciliation and therefore into harmony with Him. It means to also win over. So if there is a side and there is another side, it's to win them over to the right side. And uh, that's really what the ministry of reconciliation is about. And to cause, to accept. I like that particular definition because I'm sure that you and I would agree uh, accepting Jesus, uh, accepting the ways of God was not really prominent in our mind when the gospel was presented to us. But somehow, through His Spirit, through His Word, He caused us to accept Him. He brought us face to face with the reality that this was necessary. So there are three things we need to remember about this ministry. First of all, that the world is in serious trouble. Secondarily, there is a Savior for the world in trouble. And thirdly, that we must tell the world in trouble about that Savior. I like the picture that you're looking at there. It represents a man who is distraught, devastated, exhausted, beaten, and uh, wounded uh, by sin. And what is interesting is, in his left hand is a nail, in his right hand is a hammer. You know what that represents. The nailing of Jesus to the cross. It is your sin and mine that nailed him to the cross. And yet right there is a picture of reconciliation. Right there is Christ upholding this very individual who has driven the nails, you and I, 
And he has reconciled him to himself. He has made peace with him. Isn't that beautiful when you think about it? That God would have such love that the very person, the very individual, you and I, the very world that has driven the nails into his hands through our sins is embraced by him and uh, reconciled, brought back, restored. It's a beautiful concept, isn't it? The concept of reconciliation. And God initiates that concept in you and I and then in turn delivers that ministry into your hands and mine into your uh, life and mine so that we can participate in it so that we can make it ours we must be busy about the father's business about the work that God has given us and reconciliation is the whole purpose the whole idea driving uh, our Christianity if we don't um, do this if we don't participate in this ministry if we don't do what God has set us aside to do then we are failing in our directive we're failing in the purpose for which uh, we were in fact saved praise the Lord let's have a look at um, some of the facts in regards to this concept of spiritual reproduction and, and reconciliation most people imagine that when uh, God clothed himself in flesh and came to save the world. The world looks somewhat like it does today. But in fact, when, uh, when the Almighty God robed himself in flesh and came to the world, the world had approximately 250 million people in it. Have you ever thought of that? Much smaller population. I mean, uh, virtually smaller than the population of the United States. That was the whole world. And yet, God saw the need and the sin of the world so great that he came for such a small number by comparison to what we have today. Uh, you may be aware that today approximately 7.4 billion people, that's 7.4 million million people, inhabit the planet. So the message of salvation is every bit, in fact, even more relevant than ever before. The need is greater. Can you see that? Proportionally, there is a much, much larger need. Jesus said, these works that I do unto my Father, greater works than these shall ye do. And I think he was referring to the size of the task. I believe it was to do with the fact that we had an even bigger field to reach. But that's not to be discouraged. In fact, God has, has, has promised and has given us the power to do the work, and he has place the power behind us so that we can do the work that is ahead of us. A lot of people to reach an awful lot of work. The sad fact though is that still today untold millions remain untold and that's really the truth. And as we will see as we progress through this lesson, one of the greatest problems is really the, the church itself, we, you and I, the fact that we are not doing the ministry we need to be doing. We are concerned about a whole lot of other things. And please, when I say we, I don't mean necessarily you and I individually, but as a church worldwide, there are greatest con greater concerns about the color of the paint on the wall of the church and the night nature of the carpets and the quality of the pews that people sit on and the temperature of the air conditioning than there is about a lost and dying world. And as a result of that, Untold millions remain untold. Too many people still are not hearing that there is a way of salvation. They're not really hearing the gospel. They're not being brought into that beautiful reconciliation that God requires and desires of, um, of everyone. And so the answer is still the same. The, st the answer is still wrapped up in a human package. And this is a biblical fact. God has put in your hands and mine, in the church's hands, the ministry of reconciliation. No one else can do this. Politicians can't do this. Doctors can't do this. Find the, the greatest scientists, they can't do this. It takes a converted, Holy Ghost filled, baptized in Jesus' name believer to do this kind of work. Can you see the kind of qualifications you need? And you don't have to be some rocket scientist. What you have to be is a dedicated, consecrated, doing God's work type of Christian. And so the Lord has qualified you and I. We are the human package. The church is the package that has the answer. It is the place from which this ministry of reconciliation can and must flow. Brethren, without reproduction, essentially, there is a dying off. Now, an interesting fact is that right now, for instance, 
in Europe, we find there is an average of about 1.5, 1.6 children per family. This is overall an average of European countries. What is interesting is that the Muslim population going into Europe is actually averaging three to four children per family. It is estimated that within 20 years, if this was to continue, the known places that we know as Europe are no longer going to be Europe in the different countries. They're going to be Muslim in whatever context. What has happened? Lack of reproduction on one side and ultra-reproduction on the other, and there is an exchange of culture, an exchange of what exists. It's the same in the church. It's the same in the spiritual level. If we don't reproduce spiritually, uh, then clearly the number of unbelievers will continue to increase whilst the number of believers will decrease. And I want you to see, therefore, that, well, I'm going to put it this way, you're going to start having babies. Now, here is the beautiful thing about spiritual reproduction. John, you can have a baby. Yes, you can. Let me explain. In the physical, you see, in the physical, only the ladies, the females, can bring forth children. And then only within a certain number of years, uh, ideal to childbearing, okay? And then, of course, within the bonds of marriage, okay, to do it correctly. But we're not talking physical reproduction. We're talking spiritual reproduction. Now, get this. Every man, woman, child is able to reproduce spiritually, Many times over, you're not limited by time, you're not limited by age, you're not limited by circumstances, you're certainly not limited at all. All we need to do is be willing to be wombs in that sense to bear the spiritual children that God wants to bring forth. So if you never thought yourself as a, as a giving birth kind of a person, well, it's time to think again. God wants us to, through the ministry of reconciliation, to reproduce ourselves, to bring forth. And how do we do this? Well, we need to uh, conquer the world. We need to reach out into the world that is there today. Uh, there are principles to this spiritual reproduction that I would like to share with you today. And, uh, and I believe that it, they represent everything that Jesus came to earth to do. You were reconciled. Freely you have received. What does the Bible tell you to do? Freely give. You were brought forth in Christ and you were born again. And in turn, you need to introduce someone that they also may be born again. Now, I know that ultimately the new birth belongs in Christ. But we are, as it were, the, the mother, the church that brings forth. And brethren, it's time that we consider spiritual reproduction as our responsibility. Not only for ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis, reproducing those things that we started off with in personal growth, in personal love for God, but also in terms of bringing the world to Jesus. Let me speak about that for a moment. You might consider it a lofty ideal, but I don't think you could have any bigger a goal. If you, if you really want a big goal, if you really want to aim high, you know what? Jesus has given us the greatest thing that we could aim at. Conquest of the world. Uh, you, you've heard some dictators and some madmen at times design and, and trying to work ways to control the whole world. And we are told in prophecy that one day there will be a one world government. And it's shaping up that way now under the headship of one man in, the, in an effort to control the masses. This is not the kind of world, world conquest we're talking about. We're talking something by far greater. Not the controlling of the physical, but to reach the world with the spiritual. In fact, the objective of reaching uh, the world with salvation so dominated the life of Jesus that he actually ordered every aspect of his life accordingly. You'll find the Lord, he didn't need to, but he got up early in the morning to pray. Why? Because the day demanded from him that he would give out to others. And so he would get up right before day to pray and to prepare for what was up ahead. He ordered his life. Every aspect of his life was so that it was geared to bring salvation to the world. And as his followers, as his disciples, as those that profess to be Christ-like, we too must order our lives by that same objective. 
when we wake up in the morning, our relationship with God ought to be rekindled and refired, making sure that we are right. And then the next important thing is to do the work that God sent us to do, to go out as lights into this dark world, wherever we are, whether it's in our family, uh, whether it's in, uh, in the workplace, uh, whether it is at school, or in whatever context, we are to become ministers of reconciliation unto the Lord, bringing someone face to face with the reality that Jesus loves them. Well, there were certain uh, important things that Jesus did, and they were based on this concept, this objective, this reaching out to others, this bringing others to salvation. The scripture says in 1 Timothy 2, verse 3 and 4, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men. How many men? As far as God is concerned, He wants everybody saved. He doesn't leave anybody out. Uh, you know, obviously the most quoted verse of Scripture in Christianity tells you that. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, so all, anyone that wants to come, is it's an open door. God keeps no one out. But He wants to have all men to be saved. Now I want you to notice, He didn't say He wants all men to just go to church. He didn't say He just wants all men to be somehow religious. He wants them to be saved. Can you see why the qualifications for the ministry of reconciliation, are not given to people with doctorates and so forth. That's not what we're talking about. You don't need to be any more than a Holy Ghost filled, baptized in Jesus' name, fervent, consecrated believer, and you have the qualifications necessary because you are saved to show the plan of salvation, to show the way of salvation to someone else. He wants them all, wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Notice there are two steps there. Salvation, and then the teaching that brings a person on par with an understanding, the full knowledge of truth. And I think you relate when we say that some individuals may well uh, come to a place of salvation, but never come to a full knowledge of truth. And it's important that we have both. Such is spiritual reproduction. Now, I want you to think of yourself as a being that is able to reproduce. You, as a Christian, have the ability to reproduce yourself into another person. In other words, to bring the other individual face to face with the same experiences, the same blessings, the same receiving from heaven that you have had. And only you really can do that. There are certain people that possibly only you can reach, and it is important that you become uh, that individual so dedicated, so directed, and so ordered in your life that the objective is just that. I'm going to conquer the world. Lofty? Well, Jesus said that. He said to go into all the world. And I believe that we need to widen our vision to see that every individual out there is an opportunity for us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the methods that Jesus and the apostles uh, used in spiritual reproduction, you are well aware of, but I'll cover them again very quickly. Firstly, there was, of course, evangelism. Now, often, people stop at that. They sort of uh, give out a tract. They're evangelizing one way or another, and they feel they have got their work done. But actually, evangelism is only the very first step. This means reaching people with the gospel. It means the basic preaching that brings them face to face with the plan of salvation. Telling them about salvation. Okay, so Jesus showed examples of this evangelism, both in mass evangelism, where he spoke to great numbers of people at the same time, and in personal evangelism, as did the apostles. What is interesting about this is that about 70 to 80 percent of the evangelism that was carried out by both Jesus and the apostle was actually a personal evangelism. In other words, their greatest progress appears to be made on a one-to-one basis, sowing that seed individually and bringing that individual into a place of reconciliation with God. And then, by the next steps that you will see, having them go out to do the same and reproduce themselves. And so, the personal evangelism still is the most important, the most effective way to reach out to the lost today. So yes, when you speak to that person one-on-one, 
when you invite them home for a cuppa and you share with them the gospel, when you over lunch open your Bible and you say, yeah, well, I want let, me, let me show you something from the scriptures. When you talk to them one on one, you don't have to be a, an evangelist that preaches to thousands at the same time. That's great. If God gives you that opportunity, do it. But the greatest form of evangelism found in the scriptures and by far the most effective appears to be the one on one. Each one reach one. Each one reach out to another one. And, and as that one becomes mature, they reach out to another. And it's amazing what the multiplication rate looks like. And we'll see that in a moment. The next step was, after evangelism, that they established them by teaching them the things of God. And this is why I'm saying that sometimes we think evangelism is the end of our responsibility. Uh, not quite. Not quite. I want you to see something uh, in a flock of sheep. A sheep gives birth to a lamb. And then they don't just walk away. They establish them. And it's not until that, that lamb has grown into a certain, to a certain age and, and they're able to fend for themselves and so forth that they are actually doing their own thing. Until then, they're, they're guarded and they're fed and they're nurtured. And this is what establishing is all about. When we evangelize, when we bring someone to the things of God, when we bring someone to salvation, the next step is really to establish them. And you'll find that Jesus, of course, showed the example, as did the apostles once again, uh, Jesus established and was teaching and remained close to a group of people, uh, disciples, and uh, a group of followers. And they were constantly learning from him. And, and I have fond memories, and I guess it's uh, something that I, I'd like to see that is reproduced in your home and in, in every home of those that believe. When we first started the church, apart from church meetings, and there were two midweek meetings, by the way, uh, but every night of the week there was a home Bible study being taken place, either in our home or in someone else's home. Every night. There was no free nights because they were all taken up with the ministry of reconciliation, telling someone about Jesus. And we have to make certain, therefore, that when... When we are actually uh, you know, taking stock of our time, we include, we make certain that we give priority to the establishing of, of people, evangelizing and establishing. Well, the third step that the apostles, and of course the Lord Jesus did, was to equip them. Once people were tr established, they would train them and actually teach them how to reach out to others. And so if you can appreciate what we're saying is that in this context, uh, the, the produ reproduction is complete. The person who starts off the process is reconciled to God. They introduce a new individual. They establish them. They train them. And what does this individual do now? They go and reproduce themselves. And uh, I believe that whilst uh, the shepherd may well lead the sheep to places of feeding and water and protection and so forth, as sheep we must reproduce and nurture and teach and establish so that the new individuals can in turn uh, also reproduce themselves. This method of spiritual reproduction is so normal, it's so obvious, uh, that we understand it in the physical sense very readily, don't we? Every normal living thing reproduces itself, and we don't consider that unusual. We don't, we don't put a, a grain of wheat in the ground or a bean and put it in the ground and go, oh, Wow, look what happened. You fully expect that it's going to grow and it's going to reproduce itself, don't you? It's just kind of normal. And it should be just as normal, just as obvious, just as uncalled for any great surprise that when it comes to spiritual reproduction, Christians, God-filled, Holy Ghost-filled, dedicated, loving Christians uh, who are alive in the Spirit also reproduce themselves. It should be no great shock to our system. The problem is that unfortunately, uh, we can, if we're not careful, because of the pressures of the world, the modifications of life, and because of the of the you know, infiltration of wrong thoughts and wrong ideas, we can become hybrid seeds. Have you heard of them? Hybrid seeds don't reproduce themselves. You can't take seeds from that to propagate any further. And that's a very sad shame. The truth is that God wants us to be 
fruitful and not sterile. And so when it comes to the spiritual reproduction, we have to evangelize. We need to establish those that we evangelize, and then we need to train them, equip them uh, to reproduce also. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy these words. He says, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. What was the Apostle Paul describing? He was saying, Timothy, you have learned from me. I have reproduced myself in you. He said, now the things that you have heard, those things that you have grown in, that you have appreciated, that you have benefited from, those very things commit unto faithful men, other individuals who may be able to teach others also. We are talking about the spiritual law of reproduction. We're talking about the ministry of reconciliation. The Apostle Paul spoke about it, and certainly each and every one of us need to participate in that also. Praise the Lord. Can you say praise God? God has not left you without a purpose. God has certainly not left you without a ministry or a direction or a plan of action. And uh, again, I, I want to stress the point here that when we don't reproduce, that's not normal. I mean, we should have the surprise when we plant the seed and nothing comes out. That should sort of make us think, well, what was wrong with that seed? There must have, it's not viable. There's something wrong with that. We plant another, it doesn't come out. There's something wrong with that. That should make us sit up and take notice. So the norm or the normal is reproduction. When there is no reproduction, we have to be alerted to say something is wrong. Now I need to ask yourself a question. And I don't want to ask you. I want you to ask yourself. When was the last time that I had a baby? And I ain't talking about a physical baba in your arms. I'm talking about a spiritual baby. When was the last time that you gave birth, that you reproduced yourself into someone else? And that will give you an indication of whether or not you're in that normal scheme, normal level, normal factor that God wants us to be in as Holy Ghost-filled believers. You don't have to give me the answer. Just give yourself that answer. And if it's been a while, then we need to say, Lord, help me to be fruitful. Help me and be available for God to use us to do the work. Because there's someone out there that you can reach. Someone that you can speak to. Someone that you can reproduce yourself in and become, again, a reconciler. Praise God. Well... God has not left us without a purpose. He has given us a plan of action. And in fact, these are the scriptures that I'd like you to notice very clearly. Uh, Jesus said in John 20, 21, Peace unto you, as my Father sent me, even so send I you. So here it is, the same ministry that Jesus came to begin on earth, which has reconciled us to himself. He's now saying, I'm sending you. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. God, who is our Lord, our Savior, our God, is sending you. If you were in a business and you direct someone to go somewhere, to do something, you would fully expect that they carry out your directives. I think that Jesus is looking for such faithfulness also. And when he returns, he will judge us according to how we have been obedient to him. Now, please understand, there are many areas of obedience. I, and I'm not relating all of our life just to this. But this is one of the main areas in which we find difficult of being individuals that will do the work of reconciliation. God wants you and I to do the work that he started. He began it, and he wants us to continue it. Now, we find in the first century church... Uh, that the saints went out everywhere. And wherever they went, they spoke about the things of God. And revivals of Christianity have taken place throughout the centuries. You can see them. Little fires have burned. And they did amazing things. Amazing conversions took place at different times. But as time has rolled on, revivals have diminished. The number of fires lit have become fewer. 
We don't hear of revivals like the Welsh revival or the revival in Scotland. We don't hear of mass conversions like we used to hear uh, even as late as the 60s down in, say, Colombia, South America. Great revivals of Pentecost, amazing outpourings of the Holy Ghost. Perhaps the world is getting darker. Maybe there is a different ground we're dealing with. But the Word of God is still the same. Amen? The power of God is still the same. And God is not saying to us, you've got to bring in hordes of people. Just reproduce yourself. I want you to see the emphasis here. Your responsibility, reproduce yourself. When you've done that, you have reproduced yourself a hundredfold. That's beautiful, isn't it? And that's faithfulness unto God. Uh, I believe that... Uh, Doing the work that God has sent us to do is incredibly satisfying. And when he sends us, then what should we do? I send you, says Jesus. What should we do? Say it. Go. Well, I think that's exactly what Jesus says. He says unto them, go ye into just this portion of the world and that corner and be selective. What does he say? Into all the world. So notice that the conquest or the winning over or the directive goes for the whole world. This go is for the whole world. And the action that we are to do is exactly what he showed us by his example. We are to preach the gospel to every creature. We are to share what we have received. The salvation that we have received. The ministry of reconciliation that was given to us. We are to pass it on to someone else. This means teaching them. This means baptizing them. It means teaching them again to become soul winners themselves. In fact, here is the, uh, the portion of scripture in our Matthew 28 verse 19 to 20. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, which is Jesus. Jesus in the name of the Son, which is in the name of the Holy Ghost, which is in Jesus' name. Baptizing them in Jesus' name. Amen. Teaching them to observe all things. How many things? Everything that I uh, have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The directive is fairly clear. Now, I'm sure that you with me would uh, recognize that um, when Jesus spoke to the apostles, he didn't expect these 12 individuals to go and do this themselves, the whole world. He expected them to be faithful at the level, and they did. They went everywhere preaching. But the whole world, even back then, was 250 million people. So clearly this commission is not just for them. It is for everyone who has come into this reconciliation with God. And that includes you and I. It includes you and I to do exactly what God has directed or shown us uh, to do. Notice the three things that he wants us to do. First of all, we are to teach and preach. This means deliver the gospel. It means to make those uh, inroads. Yeah, in order to deliver the gospel, which is the seed, and put it in the ground, we've got to kind of plow the ground up a little bit. Sometimes, you, and you do, you need to be wise to open up that ground. It takes a bit of friendliness. It takes a little bit of boldness to, to do that plowing work. But there has to be some teaching and preaching of the gospel. When you take the gospel to a person, you are doing the preaching and teaching that God sent you to do. But as we've explained, it doesn't end there. In fact, the exciting part is that when you have done the planting, uh, to begin with, you see nothing. You put that seed in, you think, right, I've done it. When does the exciting part happen? You start to see the tiny little blade. And that, that's exactly uh, where, where it's at. You start to see the growth. You see, when you continue to work at that level, and you take the person through, and you show them uh, baptism, and you see them baptized in Jesus' name, and filled with the Holy Ghost, you're beginning to see a germination, aren't you? And even that's exciting. But even that isn't all that there is to be seen. What God wants us to do now is to nurture and to feed. And this is where the teaching all things comes into. You see, it starts with teaching, it ends with teaching, doesn't it? Can you see why we do so much teaching in the church? Important, isn't it? It's important because it begins with the teaching and preaching of God's Word. And it continues throughout. By being saved, then we teach further how to stay saved and how to see others reached with salvation. Brethren, we are to train those that come in 
and show them how to reproduce themselves. And so that in context, uh, those uh, that have come in that were reached become the reachers. In fact, let me put it in these terms. God wants you to participate. God wants you to be the person at the foreground. Don't rely on just the leaders. Don't rely on the pastor to do it all. It's your job along with me. It is our job together. It is your task as well so that those that were taught become the teachers. Yeah? Those that were reconciled become the reconcilers. And those that were converted become the convertors. Those that bring others to conversion. How long has it been since you brought forth a baby for Jesus? The church, we are the church And as such, as it were, the mother of the souls that are to come. Jesus is the only one that can give life. But he gives us the opportunity to reach others. Uh, So from um, these uh, disciples who are faithful, who are willing to reproduce, comes a multiplication. A multiplication that is very, very significant. I want you to see this uh, with me, how important and significant this is. God said go into all the world, right? So the, go- the goal is the world. And yet it starts with just one. It starts just with you and I. Let me show you the power of one here this morning and how relevant it is. Because if we understand this, we will realize that the commission of Christ is realistic. We can really reach the whole world for Christ, with, for the Lord. Have a look at this. One grain of corn can reproduce a thousand grains a year. So if you take just one little grain, and by the way, I'm not sure if you're aware, but corn is the most produced product or cereal in the world. Most of the masses of the world consume this cereal ahead of everything else. 822 million tons of corn are produced worldwide every year. More than any other cereal, more than any other crop, corn holds the first place. And yet we have, in just, a, in just one lot of corn, in just one grain of corn, the answer to, if you please, feed the entire world. Think about it this way. If one grain of corn can reproduce a thousand grains in a year, by replanting each crop, it has been estimated that within six years, the whole earth would be planted up with corn. There would be no such thing as famine. Crazy, huh? But it would mean that every single grain has to be replanted. And you can see the multiplication. But it starts with just one grain. Now, I I understand that nobody's going to start with just one grain. We start with much, much more than that. and, And we have a totally... But just to understand the mathematics of this, one grain can multiply into the whole world being fed with, with this grain for within approximately six years. Well, something similar can be said if one individual who is dedicated, consecrated, and in the Spirit of God begins to witness for God. Think about this. If you start with just this kind of plan, and I want you to understand what I'm talking about now. You plan in your mind to spend a year, not a day, not a week, not a month, a whole year, to find, reach one soul. Find one soul in one year, and you teach them, and you disciple them, and you teach them to reach out to someone else. Just one in the whole year. I don't think that's too high a calling, right? This is what would happen if the same application would would work and every individual would continue the same process. Look at this. Each one reaches one. In the first year, one soul would reach another, so there would be two at the end of that first year. If you just cast your eye, you'll see that if, if each one was to do the same thing, within 15 years, there would be 32,768 people converted. Holy Ghost filled shouting for God, and doing exactly the same thing, reaching out to others. Look what would happen inside approximately 30 years. Look at the multiplication power. Within 33 years, you would have reached 8,589,934,592 people. That's just one individual. Reproduction, reproduction, reproduction. Think about this. God hasn't given us just 33 years. 
So far, the church has had this message for 2,000 years. Now let that sink in for a minute. If it was possible to do this if, with every individual, you know, we would reach the whole world inside some, you know, 30 odd years. But 2,000 years have gone by, so many multiples of that, and yet there are millions who are yet untold. Now, I, I understand that we're talking a mathematical equation here. In real life, uh, not everybody you speak to is going to be converted, and not everyone is going to come to the Lord. But then there isn't just one of us doing it. If all of us took on to do the work of reconciliation, the ministry that God has sent us to do, and we just won one individual only per year and taught them to do the same. Think about it. If 10 of us did it this year, how many people extra would we have at the end of the year? 10, right? But then if those 20 now do the same thing in that year, at the end of the second year, you would have 40 people. So we can do it within the church if we just simply learn to do the work God's way. So what I'm trying to drive home is that what Jesus directed or commanded us to do, to go into all the world to reach, and notice we didn't say convert, but to reach the whole, the whole world with the gospel, is actually doable. If Christians today become the kind of Christians that are consecrated, that are dedicated, who want to make certain that they participate in the ministry of reconciliation. I want to show you a law as we continue on this thought, and I call it the law of God's harvest, and it's based on this scripture from Psalms 126 verse 6. Jot this verse down, please read it and hide it in your heart, memorize it, remember it, and then practice it. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless Come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Praise God. Now, it doesn't say maybe. It doesn't say it might happen. This is the word of God. The word of God is without fault. And it is absolute. It is irrevocable. God said, this is my law of harvest. Let's analyze it for a minute and have a look at the three steps that we find in this verse. First of all, it talks about going forth. Say going forth today. Okay, so he that goeth forth. You can see there is an action implied here. God wants us to get out of our comfort zone and make the efforts. Now I know from time to time someone will come knocking at your door and ask you about the things of God. And that's wonderful. But that's rare too. In most cases, it's got to be you who are the missionary who go forth, who go ahead and do the work that God has sent you to do. That's why Jesus sent us, because we have to go. And uh, the going forth process means that we've got to get out of our comfort. We must, must go and we must be motivated to do those things uh, that we don't particularly prefer to do. When do we go forth? Well, we go forth whenever we open our mouths to people at work, people that we work with, our friends, our relations, anyone we meet, all those that are not saved. We are looking to introduce them to Christ. We are wanting to give to them the very reconciliation that God uh, gave to us. We are ministers for God and we have to go forth. You can't have someone else push you or shove you. It's got to be a personal choice. You've got to step forward and say, Lord, I don't know who I'm going to talk to today, but whoever it is, help me to say the right things. Help me to witness. Give me the wisdom. Help me to and be in the Spirit, because God is going to use you. There is another step to this. It says, he that goeth forth, weeping. Say weeping here today. Weeping, this is referring to the shedding of tears, but more than that, it's actually talking about the fasting and the prayer that accompanies the work of God. You see, there is a certain emotional involvement, a spiritual emotional involvement that is in Saul Winnie. We have to be emotional about the fact that at every second, a soul is going into eternity every second. I, I, I called up a clock on the, on the internet recently and it showed uh, the real time number of births and deaths. And obviously there are more births and deaths. The population is increasing. But I was astounded at how quickly somebody was dying somewhere in the world. Another soul into eternity and another and another. And it was quicker than every second. Have a look at it for yourself. 
And so you think about this. There is a certain amount of weeping. There is a certain emotional involvement that has to be from our side a, a real feeling that I have to reach someone before they don't have the opportunity anymore. While I can. While it is yet day. While there is yet time. The desire to win the lost has to cause us to weep before God and, and pray. And so when we actually go and, uh, and talk to somebody, we must go with prayer, knowing that somehow, by the grace of God, uh, we are going to be used to bring them to reconciliation. Pray for that seed that you've sown. Pray for the words that have been given. Pray that they will take root. Pray against the devil snatching it away. Pray that, and, and be emotional about this. If you're talking a life. More than that, you're talking about eternity. And so, there is a certain emotional involvement in soul winning, and there ought to be, so that, in fact, uh, we must uh, water, as it were, the seed that we have sown with the very prayers, the tears, and the weeping that God expects from us. I think one of the problems is that uh, we have lost the art of weeping for souls. We have lost the feeling of what it means for a soul to go to eternity. And uh, it's difficult to reach out to a soul when we have no feeling for them. So develop that feeling again. Make sure that you have that weeping of soul within you. And then lastly, we have to bear the seed. It's important that we bear the precious seed. That precious seed is a seed of God's love. Now listen, no farmer would expect to reap a crop where he hasn't sown. So you've got to put the seeds in the ground. You've got to make sure you plant them and scatter them. And you can see that uh, in doing that, there is a certain amount of love and patience, wisdom that is implied. And uh, when the spirit of the uh, individual that's to be converted is tender, that seed finds the right soil, and it sinks in, and it begins to bring forth fruit. Don't expect necessarily that everybody you'll speak to will respond that way, but just know this, that every person you speak to that doesn't gives you closer to the one that will. So the key is to multiply our efforts, making sure that we stay at the work faithfully. Naturally, there can be no harvest uh, without uh, the planting of the seed. And, uh, but if we do plant the seed, if we, if we do the work faithfully, then we know we are going to see results. One of the things that we do, I want you to see this, and please be careful of this, I've been guilty of it myself. Sometimes we pray to God and say, Lord, bring this person in. Uh, and, uh, you know, like, we, we, we want the Lord to save them. It's okay to, to, to pray that way. But you see, what we are trying to do sometimes is to offload the task that He gave us to do back on God and saying, Lord, You do the work of bringing them in. What did Jesus say? I send you forth, you be fishers of men. He wants you and I to bring them in, compel them to come in. We need to speak to them. We need to reach them. And so we have asked Him to win the souls that He has asked us to win. And uh, we need to sow the seed, be faithful at doing the work that He has called us to do. Now again, when a farmer has planted a crop and he wants to harvest it, he doesn't say, okay, crop, here's the barn, please come in. Is that what happens? No, no, no. He goes out there and he physically cuts that thing down, and he brings it into his barn. Can you see the action here? There is a physical, even when it's grown, we have to bring it in. And so it is necessary that we don't just invite people along, that we show them the reason why they ought to be in church, why they ought to love Jesus, that we show them they must be reconciled with God, that their souls are crying out for reconciliation. You and I will see an irrevocable harvest when we plant the seed and we do it God's way. So here is the word of God for you in Isaiah 55, 11. It says this, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. Are you hearing what God is saying? He's making you and I a promise. When you preach His word, when you teach His word, when you share the word of God, it's not going to return void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. Doesn't mean everybody's going to be converted. Sadly, some will reject God, but God promises there will be a harvest. We have a guarantee. There is going to be a conversion. There's going to be a reconciliation. And it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. God says that when we faithfully teach God's word, 
and throw the seeds and we go forth weeping, bearing the seed, doing the work of training or teaching and, and uh, seeing people train, we're going to see a harvest. Praise God. The teaching of God's word will result. It will result. There is an assurance in God's word. It will result in a harvest of souls. Praise God. Well, if you want to see someone saved, well, it's time to bring forth a baby. Now, you might say, oh, yeah, well, look, you know, when I'm finished my course, when I get married, I remember somebody saying to me, oh, if only God would supply me with a wife, you know, I would be so faithful and I would just serve him and I just need a wife, you know. And so God supplied him a wife. He's not even in the church today. Sad, huh? You see, we, we put conditions on if God, but God said go. He says, do my will first, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things I will add unto you. I know we're all busy. I know we all have to earn a living. I know we're all tired. I know we all have our own families to take care of. But God still says go. He still has given you and I the ministry of reconciliation. And if we don't bring forth children, we will be barren. And in context... There is not unlimited time. We have to work, uh, the Bible says, while it is yet day. Let me remind you of this. It's found in John chapter 9. Jesus said, I must work the works of Him that sent me. Remember, Jesus was sent of the Father, and in turn He sent you and I. And this applies. It says, and I have to work these works while it is day. Why is that? Because the night cometh when no man can work. Some of the tears that I believe Jesus will wipe in heaven will be because we will have realized that there is no more time to reach anybody. We had the time. We had the opportunity. We missed it. We may have made it, but we have made it without the crowns. We have made it without the results. We have made it without the results that God wanted us to bring. And that is a sad event. Imagine how many more could potentially share eternity in heaven with us if we were faithful at the ministry of reconciliation. I want you to see yourself as an ambassador for God, sent to reconcile the world as Jesus was. He has sent you. So we need to do something important. Win the soul, disciple the soul, train the soul to win others. Amen? It's a process of reproduction. It should be as normal, as natural as breathing. It must become so natural, so normal for us, that we ought to wonder when it doesn't happen, not when it happens. We so rejoice very much uh, when it happens, and we ought to. Uh, but we ought to be aware when it's not part of our day-to-day experience. Brother and sister, let's win people. Be a winner. Win people. Let's disciple people. We are called not only to be disciples, but to disciple others and train them in turn to win and disciple other individuals. Praise God. So, you have the Great Commission. Jesus said, go ye unto all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So be it. So we have the commission and we have the power. God said this, He said, you shall receive what? Power. Power. And He gave us the power. He kept His part of the deal. He filled you with the Holy Ghost. Power to do what? Well, so that you can be witnesses unto me. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. What's missing? We have the Word of God. We have the tools. uh, We have home Bible studies we can teach. And by the way, the first century church often reached souls in the home. You find references in the book of Acts time and time and time again about uh, their work being done from house to house. And they went from house to house, from house to house. That's where the work was done. Home Bible studies are still one of the best ways that you can reach souls. I wonder if you could take it in your heart. Let me speak to you for a moment, to your heart. If you could take it in your heart during this year, to at least reach out to one individual and get them to the place where they want to know about God and you start a home Bible study with them. Sacrifice one evening. Sacrifice one 
time, an hour, whatever it is, through the day, whatever you can fit it in, and they can fit it in, to teach them the Word of God. To win them, to disciple them, and to train them. Imagine what would happen to your life if you could reproduce yourself every year. Somebody said it is a very healthy thing to give birth. Us men will never know what that's like, but we can know what it's like spiritually. And I know it is a great joy to see a new soul coming forth and being saved in Christ, continuing in Him. In him. Well, let me leave you with this thought. Each one must reach one. My responsibility, your responsibility. But we have to remit ourselves to God. We have to resign ourselves to doing the work of God. We have to make so certain we repent of our lack of fruitfulness and put the R on each. <laughs> each one. Reach one. Praise the Lord. Will you stand with me this morning? I pray that this has stirred up some thoughts and some desire in your heart. And that if nothing else, it has reminded you of the very important ministry that God has called each of us to perform. The ministry of reconciliation. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads in prayer and ask the Lord's blessing. Brother Mark, could I ask you please to close the Bible study in prayer? Thank you, Jesus. Thank, Thank you, Lord, Savior. Hallelujah. Your holy word, O God. Thank you, Father. We praise you.